Okay, so the war with Spain. Manifest destiny in the 40s, right? So we talk about manifest destiny. We talk about how that, that's been coined. The, the term manifest destiny was coined. We talked about what it meant at that time. Was it, was it significant? Very. Oh, hold on. You know what? I forgot my extra speaker. Okay. So, so who was collecting colonies? Speak up. Remember? Everyone. Everyone. Especially Mexico. Not Portugal, Germany. Major world powers. Major world powers. Okay, but how about Eastern world powers? Who in the East was collecting colonies? China and Japan. Japan, for sure. China wasn't really, you know, China has some of the most interesting history. I don't know if you ever get to study it because at some point they had expanded and, and there's a theory that they actually explored the world, that it was a Chinese map that showed Antarctica, okay? And that they explored the world and found North America well before anyone, okay? Right. And see, what happened is they would, they would explore and then they had, um, they had rulers who didn't believe in exploring any longer. And so they shut down, they basically shut down the borders. Okay, so nobody could go in, nobody could come in, nobody could go out. Of China. I mean, they had an armada that was larger than any other fleet in the world. Okay, but then it's a fascinating history and way more than we can get into at this time. But in the 1840s, it was on, they were anti-exploration. Okay, so the Japanese, however, were not. And so you've got the 1880s, 18, where, where Japan is expanding. And they also had gone back and forth and, you know, it had periods of more expansion than, than not. Did you have a question? Didn't Japan explore the Philippines and the, the islands down in the South Pacific? Japan, they all explored every, and it's hard to, um, it's hard to know, and I haven't done a lot of scholarship on, on their specifically, um, so it's, it's hard to say exactly where they went. Okay, and so, they all believed that this exploration led to greatness. Their empire, they wanted their empires to be great, right? It was a time period when this was all happening. And so, but everyone did want the China trade. And that was one of the, the reasons, is because of that, um, of the spices and that. And so, the area, this region of the world in the Pacific and in uh, the South Pacific, and near Indonesia, that's one of the major uh, reasons for that. And that's why everyone was going after these islands, because these islands, you could grow spices, right? And now sugar. So you watched the, the movie last night about the queen, Lily Kawani, and sugar. So what about the sugar? Why was sugar so important to these planters? Easy to grow. Easy to grow. It was the big business. What did it do? Remember what it did for planters in uh, the American colonies? So, they're buying it in large quantities. Okay. And so now that... Speak up. Now that everyone can expand their sugar business into Hawaii and export that much more. Right. So, so big business... How much did they make? How much money did these sugar growers make in the West Indies and in the American colonies? Astronomical amounts of money. 
So you get that and you get an island or a set of islands that are is ripe for sugar. What's that do to the people who are the planters? It makes people want to move out there. It makes people want to do almost anything to keep their sugar growing, right? So this is another thing that you have to understand about the bayonet constitution. Is those sugar planters, we're going to lose all of that money. Were they prepared to lose that money? These kids and these mission grandchildren? No way. <laughs> no way. I mean, they hand over bit money in money, right? So, <clears throat> as as we are, as the missionaries are there in in Hawaii, the buildup around the world is for these greater navies and for this expansionism, and so you have um, these nations looking to expand. Uh, America needed some ports. They needed deep water ports. They needed, if they were going to expand their navy, they needed naval ports, right? So <clears throat> they looked at this area. Americans were already living there. Americans had um, not infiltrated, but they had woven themselves into the very being of the Hawaiian monarchy, right? Because they created a constitutional monarchy, right? And it was the planters or the mission, uh, the missionaries who did that, right? And it was their their uh, descendants who were some of the very first ones. Okay, so you have these very very strong ties, and they had some very interesting um, comments in there. You had Thurston's. Uh, descendant who said that he thought it was the best thing to overthrow the monarchy in Hawaii, and then you had, um, and then you had people on the other side who said the monarchy should never have been overthrown. Okay, so you you got both points of view in the movie. All right, so. As we are going through Hawaii and even the other South Pacific Islands, one of the uh, one of the important things to understand is also they were there to spread religion. Now, Columbus was there to spread religion, correct? Right. So it's a common theme as you are developing these colonies that you're going to spread religion, whichever religion it is, and at this time it happened to have been Christianity, okay? The Muslim religion was also going to spread, and that especially was spreading within the um, Indonesian islands and in that area of the world, okay? And so <clears throat> Teddy Roosevelt was one of the proponents of expansion, and he said, we need a good war, okay? And then you have people like Benjamin Franklin who are anti-war, right? Obviously in a different time. But think about how history changes and think about how people look at things so very differently. Had Teddy Roosevelt lived in a different time, would he have said we need a good war? You know? Um, how about, you know, the Civil War? Was that a good war? It was a very hard war. I mean, one in five people died. Every single family was affected. So, Teddy Roosevelt, in his, in his expansionism, decided that, that, hey, this would, expansionism was worth the cost of war. Okay? And so remember that as we um, continue on and expand into Cuba. All right. So <clears throat> they were having issues with Canada over fishing rights in Alaska and off of Canada and Washington. Okay. Um, that that resolved itself, and then they moved to South America, and you have Chile, where there is a civil war in Chile, and. Um, 
the Chileans were tra were coming in and they wanted to buy um, weaponry in San Diego, and the U.S. said no. But then they went in, um, and the uh, the Havana was sunk. Okay. You also have uh, Venezuela and the British or British Gu uh, Guyana. Does anybody know what? that is now called British Guyana beautiful country absolutely stunning country close Belize okay known for their ecotourism today but at this time they were a colony of Britain British Guyana of course and there was a border dispute between the two of them okay so those were, were both settled without war, but you could see where America was becoming, was instituting themselves in these areas. And then Britain comes back and says, hey, um, what about the Monroe Doctrine? <laughs> right? Um, and so were they flaunting the Monroe Doctrine? Does everybody remember the Monroe Doctrine? And what does it mean? What's it mean? What's that? Part, what's the main premise of the Monroe Doctrine? Brianna's going to look it up. <laughs> okay, Brianna, you're on. It's, uh, it was Yes, so a potential hostile act if another country is interfering in any nation in the Americas. Okay, so what are we doing? Interfering in the Americas, right. And that was thrown up to the United States, but the United States was like, that's fine. Um, so just in that short amount of time, 60 years, you see how those things have changed? Okay? Diplomacy, <laughs> diplomacy will flip-flop um, dramatically. And you, in your lifetimes, <coughs> you will, you won't be so entertained by it because you could be adversely affected by some of it, but you will see that in your <coughs> lifetime uh, multiple times. Okay, so as they're looking for refueling stations and island ports so that they can, one, uh, develop this navy, two, build colonies to become a greater nation, and three, to expand the China trade, um, the U.S. and Germany and Britain had a three-way protectorate over the Samoan Islands, okay? Uh, you had Hawaii, which was seen as strategic. You had uh, that map that you have in your book that has uh, all of the islands. It has Midway, it has the Hawaiian Islands, yeah, Guam, Samoa, the atolls, okay? All right, and then we move on to the Bayonet Constitution, which, of course, forced the the um, Hawaii to give up Pearl Harbor, which they had requested, um, but the king had said no, and the king was actually trying to create a relationship with Japan, right, and so that came in. And so you have the American planters, right, the sugar planters, who had negotiated this this trade agreement with the United States, so they had the protected trade, and then that was canceled. Okay? So these sugar planters are going to lose everything. The price went down 40% automatically. Okay? They no longer had this protected trade. They could no longer sell as much or as as easily to the United States. 
Okay, so you can see where um, you can see where that's going. So they were definitely going to protect their own interests. And Lilia Kawani and her brother, who had been forced to sign the Bayonet Constitution after he died, she was also again trying to re um, reassert Hawaiian power. Okay. Um, As she's doing this, and as the um, Committee of Safety is working behind the scenes, your, your book describes her. Did, you, did, you any, did any of you catch how your book is describing the Queen? Or how they described her? Anti-American, but it was more than that. It was definitely anti-American, but it was hostile. Right. She was hostile toward America. Now, from the perspective of the movie that you watched, was she hostile toward America? Because she didn't fight back. She just said she seemed to like America, actually, a little bit, because she believed that they would find out the truth and she would be put back on the throne. Yes. Yes. Is that just two different views? It is definitely two different views. And I wanted to make sure to point that out to you because as you read your history books, and even the book that I found that I find the least biased, you will find definite bias in some of your books. Okay? Um, so, again, I say you question everything. There's m always more to the story. Okay? So, um, yes, yeah, she, she did believe that America would restore her to the throne, the United States, as opposed to the um, mission kids who really had their own interests in mind. Um, you know, especially given the fact that they had written all of the uh, Hawaiians out of the Constitution. They were no longer citizens, could no longer vote. Right? Okay. So, <clears throat> the McKinley Taft, or the, excuse me, the McKinley Tariff is the one that eliminated the duty-free status of Hawaiian sugar. So, <clears throat> as Grover Cleveland comes and uh, looks for at the Blunt report, uh, you know, Blunt was very blunt about the fact that America had overstepped its boundaries, okay? But, Grover, you made a good point uh, after the movie, Aiden, that, you know, whose fault was that? Was it the president's fault because he didn't uh, pursue it, you know? Um, he didn't make his citizens obey what he said and then you have McKinley come in and McKinley is pro annexation he's pro business right he is big bit he's the epitome of big business who got him there business, business. JP Morgan yes was one of yeah I'm not, I'm not sure about Carnegie but definitely uh, the other two right and so yeah he was all about the sugar growers, he was all about that that annexation. He was all about the port and expansion. All right. So here is the letter of protest of the annexation that was signed by Queen Lilia Kawani. Okay. I, Lilia Kawani of Hawaii, heir apparent, on the 10th day of April, 1877, and proclaimed Queen of the Hawaiian Islands on the 29th of May of January, 1891, do hereby protest against the annexation of ownership by the United States of America of the so-called Hawaiian Crown lands, accounting to about one million acres of and which are my property. Okay. And the and the letter goes on. It's a very powerful letter. She was and she was 
She had been um, trained by the missionaries. She had been schooled by the missionaries. So she knew how it worked. Okay, and she did believe that America would, uh, would do right. And then the next slide is the, the picture of the queen. And here is the joint resolution annexing Hawaii. The 55th Congress of the United States at the second session. Whereas, ta -da! Eric, did you leave your lights on? We just had a call from the high school that said you might have left your lights on. No, I don't think I did. Okay. I'll go out. Uh, Thanks. You know, when I Thanks, Where is the government of the Republic of Hawaii having in due form signified its consent in the manner provided by its constitution, the code absolutely and without reserve to the United States of America, all rights of sovereignty of whatsoever kind in and over the Hawaiian Islands and their dependencies. Okay? So as they rewrote the constitution after they threw out the queen, um, they... <clears throat> they gave the islands of Hawaii to the United States government. It's, it's a fascinating uh, turn of events where you can see, and, and it, it actually affects you of um, national, well, the, the change in nations, because it was its own country. All right? with an empire. And then the next slide, maybe, talks about the, the crisis over Cuba and Spanish Cuba. Okay, so an anti-Spanish rebellion broke out in 1895. Okay, um, U.S. business had a lot of money invested there. So American business didn't necessarily want a civil war because they were making money. Right? Big business. This is the time of big business. And almost everything that you see has an influence from big business. Right? So the rebels had little support. But what changed the minds of Americans regarding Cuba? Pulitzer's uh, newspapers and journals. Yes. Pulitzer and Hearst wrote sensational articles. All right, so think Inquirer articles. You know, the Inquirer, the one with, you know, 300 pound man, you know, I don't know, make up a story, <laughs> any story that you can make up. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> at this time they didn't make up everything, but they did definitely uh, sensationalize it to gain sympathy for the rebels. And in 1897, a new Spanish government was seeking peaceful resolution, and then the U.S. battleship Havana was sunk, where there were 297 uh, sailors who died, okay? And <clears throat> Spanish concessions, so the Spani Spanish um, paid and uh, said, we're sorry, but it didn't uh, stop the war. And so on April 11th of 1897, McKinley sent a war message to Congress. Okay. So think about that. That's, that's two Aprils, right? Cuba was April 11th, and then uh, you had April 10th. With Hawaii. With Hawaii, yeah. And what year was that, the April 10th? Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> there was this joint resolution recognizing Cuba's independence and authorizing force to expel the Spanish. So they were going to expel the Spanish and then leave. Did that happen? No, the United States didn't leave. What did they get? Protectorate, yes. Right. Cuba they took as a protectorate until um, it's supposed to be 1902, okay, <clears throat> but they also 
um, they also got something else significant. What'd they get? They had looked for it in Hawaii and got it. No, not sugar. Ports. Ports. All right, naval ports. And what's the name of the naval port that we have there today? Guantanamo Bay. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> the Teller uh, Amendment renounced the U.S. In interest in the sovereignty and jurisdiction and control. All right. So it pledged that the U.S. would leave it alone, leave Cuba alone when it was independent. And the war actually was only a few days of combat. On May 1st, Dewey sailed into Manila Bay. Okay, there are lots of songs. That, I don't know about lots of songs, but there are songs about Dewey um, sailing into Manila Bay in the Philippines. And what did they do in Manila Bay? Yeah, ten of them. Remember the Spanish Armada? Right. Okay, think about the change in the status of these nations. You've seen now, you've seen the largest and best army or navy in the world, and now you have ten naval ships that are aging, who Dewey obliterates in just a few hours, practically. All right. So um, Cuba, the U.S. blockaded Cuba and um, the San Diego, Santiago port and uh, all of those ships, those six ships then were also obliterated. OK, now <clears throat> they didn't destroy all of the 10 ships. They destroyed or captured them all. But it's significant. So Dewey and, where is that ship? Where is Dewey's ship? We toured Dewey's ship. It is in Philadelphia, yes. And they were going to scuttle it. I don't know if they did or not. They didn't have enough funds to keep the ship. But it's, it, you go through the ship and it's just an old iron, is it iron? It's a steel iron, I don't know what ships are made out of. They're metal. Metal. <laughs> it's an old metal ship, right? But it is in bad shape, of course, now. But they have pictures from, of, like, Dewey, and they had dogs on board. Like, that was common at the, in those times to have pet dog, pets on board. There weren't a lot of them. You know, it was Dewey's dog. You know, only a few. But that was one thing that was really surprising to me is I didn't, I didn't realize that. But, you know, you're out to sea for months at a time. I guess you like having your companions. So as, <clears throat> as Dewey sails into Manila Bay and then uh, the U.S. has blockaded Santiago, you have the Rough Riders and you have the Three Hills in, uh, in Cuba that the Americans are fighting for. And you have black soldiers, you have white soldiers. Um, there's tension between all of them as to, well, there's just tension between, racial tension between, between even the soldiers. Um, but they won the hills. Uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, it's, it's one of the, oh, one of the quotes, or uh, one of the historic events that often gets retold with Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders there in uh, in Cuba. So by July 17, okay, remember this started in April, right? April 11th. So July 17th, Span the Spanish are seeking an armistice, okay? They want to end the, the war, right? And so the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1898, December 10th. Anybody confused about the Treaty of Paris? How many Treaty of Paris have we seen? 
multiple treaties of Paris. Why yes. <laughs> well, Paris is a great neutral site. All right? So, the Treaty of Paris was signed in um And in 1898, but, okay, so go back to 1793, Treaty of Paris, where um, the U.S. and Britain, the Treaty of Paris of 1763 was the French and Indian War, okay? So, yeah, the, we've had multiple treaties of Paris. So, but 1898, Treaty of Paris ended the Spanish-American War, and <clears throat> for Cuban independence, Cuba got independence, Right? The U.S. paid $20 million for the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam, which were Spanish territories. So, the Philippines. What are they going to do in the Philippines? Sugar, spice. Sugar, spice, ports. Right? You have strategic ports. And, uh, until 1902, the U.S. governed Cuba, and the Platt Amendment of 1901 said that the American withdrawal um, would come after Cuba agreed not to treaty with, not to enter into any treaties with any other foreign powers that would limit its independence. Okay, um, and it couldn't borrow beyond its means. Why would they put that into a treaty? You need to speak up. Cuba can't expand very easily because they can't borrow too much money. They can expand, they can't fund expansion. Okay. To not exp um, fund expansion? What's a, what would be another reason? They would default on the interest. The bond would not be the same. They could just put up the money and not have it again. Exactly. So, anti expansion and so if they owed someone, someone could come in, another nation could come in and take over, right? And we reserved the right to intervene in any circumstance and also to maintain the Navy base of Guantanamo Bay. So here's a strategic map of our war with Spain. This is a great little map here with Spain, the Gulf of Mexico, you have the Philippines, uh, Cuba. <laughs> it was a bad U.S. military move to wear wool clothing in the middle of Cuba um, in July. You would have thought they learned that from the Civil War. Yes. Yes, but they didn't have anything else during the Civil War, right? Um, and they were just unprepared. And you had brought the the black soldiers, the Buffalo soldiers, out of Indian territory, and you know they've it gets cold there, right? It gets cold in the desert. It and yeah, it it didn't do them well. All right, so the next slide is the territorial, is the map of the territorial um, expansion in the late 19th century. So it shows you the different islands and the protectorate. So acquired by purchase, which was Alaska. And look, they're separating out the Aleutian Islands from Alaska there. And then acquired by war, occupation, or unilateral resolution. So, how many territories do we still have in the Pacific? Just Guam and the Virgin Islands? Well, Samoa is, I, I don't know the political status of Samoa, but Samoa is, they have a representative in Congress who's not voting but they have a representative of those islands. Mo many of the islands have a representative at Congress 
I know Tonga does. Uh, Samoa. Um, what's the other one? Where's Bobby from? Saipan. They have someone in Congress. Um, so I don't know the exact political idea because um, Puerto Rico also was was purchased right from Spain and so Puerto Rico is actually a territory but the others I don't believe are technically territories uh, so I would have to I would have to look that up as Well, if they become independent, why do you think they, I don't know, what, what do you think they would do if they became independent? Okay. It, it would depend. I mean... They talk about Alaska seceding from the United States, right? And would Alaska survive economically? That's one of the major debates when people d start discussing whether whether a state is going to secede. Vermont talked about seceding. Um, so if you have a territory, politically, because of... Um, what election? I think it was the 2008 or 2012 election. Um, and it wasn't only to do, it didn't only have to do with the election, but they were talking about seceding because the U.S. government was uh, superseding its its rights. And that that's only a faction of the voters in the state obviously because it didn't it didn't pass right but it was making headlines at the time and people talk about Alaska seceding I'm sure that in Hawaii uh, Texas talked about seceding yes okay so <clears throat> and the same kind of uh, theory holds today if I asked last night, if you are Hawaii and you're looking at the islands around you and you understand what's going on around you, the British were taking over islands, the Dutch were taking over islands, the U.S. was taking over islands, what do you do? Do you have somebody, do you have an army that's going to hold off the U.S. Navy? No. So, if... Guam decides that they are going to um, throw off the United States and become their own nation, they would likely have to find support elsewhere unless there was a peaceful um, uh, split, right? Look at Crimea. Look at Crimea today and how that is um, transpiring where Russia has come in, they're claiming that the Russian citizens and the citizens in Crimea are asking Russia, they, they want to be part of Russia, right? So could that happen on some of these islands that are strategic? It could definitely happen. Um, and there are some islands that are their own na island nations, you know? It could very well happen, and it, they could be successful. And there are some that probably wouldn't be successful. Uh, they simply either are too strategic or they have too much infrastructure. It, take, for instance, Guam. There are a lot of, there's a lot of military on Guam, U.S. military on Guam. You also have, uh, from World War II, you have Japanese battlements and everything. Uh, still left from World War II. Okay, and here's a map. The next one is a map of 
Dewey's route in the Philippines, where you can see him sailing into Manila and them surrendering. Okay, so he sailed from uh, British Hong Kong. And British Hong Kong went back to China on what date? Yes, it was 99. Mm -hmm. But you have the Netherlands, you have Britain, Britain, French, uh, Japanese. Okay, so the Japanese at this time um, had Taiwan. Taiwan now is its own nation, and it is where many of the Chinese were fled um, under Mao's reign. Okay, and here's a map of the Cuban campaign where the USS Maine was sunk in 98. Kettle Hill, San Juan Hill, um, and El Carney, Caney. And the blockade that effectively destroyed the, the ships as they tried to um, escape. It would probably be a great place to go scuba diving. I'm sure you would find a lot of artifacts. Okay, so you guys, what time is your class? What time do you need to be there? The clock is slow. It's 9.35. What time does it start? Oh. 